Hi, welcome to the channel. We're going to continue to speak about the gospel, and this is part four. So I'm going to read a scripture from Acts chapter 28 and verse 23. Notice that this is at the end of the book of Acts, and it is towards the end of Paul's life, and he is in jail, but many people come to him, and it says, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. So here is the message that Paul had preached right through his ministry and through his life. And towards the end, he is still proclaiming the gospel of of the kingdom. So I've added then to this title and called it not only the gospel, but the gospel of the kingdom. Remember in the previous videos we mentioned that John the Baptist came preaching that the kingdom of God is near. And then when Jesus began his ministry, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near. And then right through the ministry of Jesus, he spoke about the kingdom of God. And then as the book of Acts um, opens up, we find that uh, Philip went to Samaria and he preached the kingdom of God. And so right through the book of Acts, we find the same thing. The kingdom of God is being preached. Now I've emphasized this because generally it seems that there is an understanding that the gospel is purely a New Testament message and that when we preach the gospel about the Lord Jesus and people respond and believe upon him, that they become part of the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. Now, while that is not incorrect, we need to expand our thinking and recognize that it's a far greater picture because having become part of of the family of the Lord Jesus, we are really also part of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so this is why I've asked this question in each one of these videos. What have you signed up for? What have we entered into? It's much, much more than we may realize. And that's really the emphasis of these videos and delving into the Old Testament as Paul has done by looking at the law of Moses and the prophets in explaining the gospel of the kingdom. We're endeavoring to do the same thing, looking at Old Testament scriptures and seeing how they relate to us as New Testament believers and in fact as Gentile believers who have now been added into this wonderful uh, gospel message or this good news of the kingdom of God. And now what does this really entail? What are the implications? behind all of this. So that's really what we're exploring in these videos. So let's go back to a wonderful Old Testament story, the account of Ruth, and we read this. In the days when the judges ruled, and that's very important to, to note, the writer of this book has given us that information and that's vital to the story. There was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So there was a famine in the land. That's a bad thing. Um, it was in the time of the judges, and that was the, one of the darkest times in the history of Israel, when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, as we're told in the book of Judges, and the nation of Israel constantly turned away from the Lord and began to worship other gods and suffered the consequences. So things were really bad and in a dire, dire situation. And then on top of that, there's this famine. And so the, this family moves to Moab. And the, the Moabites were an arch enemy of Israel. So they were in enemy territory. And uh, this is what happens. So we're told now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. So it seems that the tragedy continues. Not only were they in a bad situation, but now Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died and she was left with her two sons. So the, they continued to live in Moab and they married, the two sons married Moabite women. 
one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And then we are told, after they had lived there for about 10 years, so they continued to live in this enemy territory, in this dire situation, Naomi being a widow, uh, for 10 years, and both uh, Malon and Kilion, the two sons, also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So the situation had, was going from bad to worse for Naomi. It was really, really serious. So when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return from there. So they decided that there was a bit of good news and a little bit of hope. And so there were these three widows were going to pack up and leave and go back to Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead and to me. So Naomi said, don't come with me. You rather go back. Um, There's more chance of finding a husband in your own land. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. They said, no, we're going to stick with you and go back uh, to your people. But Naomi was insistent. She said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? I really have nothing to offer you. Then she continued. She said, return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Now let's notice this very clearly in the story. Naomi is the Jewess. She is an Israelite. But both Orpah and Ruth were Gentiles. So we've got the Jew and the Gentiles. And we're seeing that what the Jew is saying and what the writer of this book is saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and this is for our learning, is that Naomi was saying, I have got nothing to offer you. It seems that God has forsaken even his nation Israel. He has forsaken us. So there's nothing that I can offer you as Gentile woman. Orpah was eventually persuaded to leave. And so she left and went back to her um, place in Moab. But Ruth made this very, very famous and powerful statement. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now this is such a critical statement Because this gives us an insight into our relationship as Gentile believers with the nation of Israel. We have received the Jewish Messiah as our King and as our Lord, Jesus. We receive the Jewish uh, writings, the, the scriptures. So all of that has come from Israel. We've taken what Israel has to offer us. And this is very much in keeping with The covenant that God made with Abraham, he said, Abraham, out of you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. And then we're told Paul takes up that story and he says in Galatians that the blessings of Abraham now come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So this is where the gospel message brings us into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but also brings us into the story of Israel. And so our attitude towards the Jews is that we should say, we don't want to leave you. We want to embrace the, um, the values, the glory, the blessings of Israel. And so what we find is that God, through the Lord Jesus, has bestowed all the promises and all the blessings that he made to Israel. He has bestowed upon us. 
Now, he has not forsaken his people, but he has opened the door through the gospel to allow Gentiles to now come in and be part of this great and glorious story that God has developed from the beginning of the Bible, and it is working towards its glorious conclusion. So let's now turn our attention back to the New Testament and to Paul's teaching, remembering that Paul was an apostle to the Gentile, to the non-Jew. So he brought the gospel of the kingdom to the non-Jew, to Gentiles, and he said that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and to the Gentile also, to those that believe. And so this is what Paul tells us, and these are vital truths for us to consider in the light of what we've been saying. He says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the, all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, uh, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his people in the kingdom of light. So he is saying that God, through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus, through our repentance and receiving Jesus, being baptized in water and baptized into the body of Christ, becoming part of the family of the Lord Jesus Christ, God has qualified us to participate in this kingdom of light. He has made us worthy to be part of it. And then he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son whom he loves. So here is exactly what we are talking about. Ruth's attitude towards Naomi was that she was going to stick to those wonderful things that God had promised to the Jews. She saw in Naomi her salvation. And we're seeing in the message that comes through the Jewish Bible, through the Jewish Messiah, we're seeing our only salvation as non-Jewish people, as Gentile people. So we embrace the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, and we receive him. And God then qualifies us or translates us out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now, I'm not for one moment suggesting that Gentiles should try and live like Jews, try and keep the, the laws of Moses and try and uh, keep the feasts that are in the Old Testament, because all of these were foretelling and foreshadowing the truths that we now find in Jesus Christ. Jesus came to fulfill all of those things. So we have received the Lord Jesus. In a certain sense, we've jumped the queue and we've got the real thing, the thing that God was telling the, the nation of Israel right through the Old Testament has now come into fulfillment and into realization in the person of Jesus. And God is now offering us the Lord Jesus and an opportunity to be related to him through this wonderful gospel. But we're now part of the kingdom of God. Paul also tells us in Ephesians, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, non-Jews, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. And share us together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Now notice this. 
he says that we Gentiles have been made heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. So we should be careful to not consider the Gentile believers as the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, and therefore the bride of Christ. Because what Paul is saying is that there's a far greater story behind this gospel that he is presenting. It is to the Jew first, but also to the Gentiles. And we're all being brought together into one body, into the kingdom of God. So the bride of Christ is far broader than just the New Testament believers who've come to salvation after Pentecost. It's a far greater picture that the scripture is presenting to us. Paul also tells us in his letter to the Romans, and he uses an olive tree as an example. He says, if some of the branches have been broken off, and that he's referring to the Jews who were not believers, so they were broken off and cast aside. And you, Gentiles, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. So we share in the blessings and the promises made to Abraham. Do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant or high-minded, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. This is obviously a very severe and serious warning. But Paul, speaking about this arrogance or high-mindedness, on the part of saved Gentiles is something that we need to be very, very clear about. In this teaching that we've been considering that Paul gives to us, to say that the Gentile believers form the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, and that Israel is a separate entity, is high-mindedness or arrogance. And so he is warning us against that and telling us very clearly that God has opened a door to bring us into the same body and the same group. So we have been added to the Jewish saints who believe, and we as Gentile saints come in uh, by the blood of Jesus, and we all together, right from the beginning, from Abel, right throughout the scriptures, all believers, all saints who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ are the same body and the bride of Christ. When you look at, as we said in the last video, the New Jerusalem description in the book of Revelation. The 12 gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 foundation stones are named after the 12 apostles of the Lamb who were the foundation layers of the New Testament church and believers. So we're all part of one company and that has tremendous implications and so that's what we're really saying. We have signed up for something far greater than we may realize. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, the Jews, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So very clearly in all this teaching that Paul is giving to us, he is making no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. The, the saved Jews, those that believe, and Gentiles who now believe, are all part of the one body, the bride of Christ, and the kingdom of God. This is all one great and glorious gathering of people that Jesus is bringing together to be part of his kingdom. Let's, in conclusion, just go back to our wonderful story of Ruth and the great statement that she made. Ruth replied to Naomi, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. 
May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. So our destiny as non-Jewish believers is the same as the destiny of Israel. We have been brought into the covenant that God made with Abraham and we are being blessed with all the promises, all the blessings that God promised to Abraham and to the Jewish nation. God has opened this wonderful door through the gospel to bring us in and we are of the same body, the same kingdom and we are part and parcel of this company of people that Jesus Christ has redeemed by his blood. It is an, an enormous honor and privilege as we take the same attitude that Ruth had towards Naomi and we have apply that to our love for Israel, the Jewish people, but for particularly for the whole Bible from Genesis through to Revelation, recognizing that it's all absolutely relevant to us as Gentiles or non-Jewish believers. We've been brought in to this mega narrative and we are able to be participants and uh, enjoy the benefits and the glory of what God has promised to us in his son, Jesus Christ. This is what we've signed on for. As we respond to the message of the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus, we are brought into this greater story and this greater um, future that we have with Israel, ruling and reigning with the King of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.